Mitchell has his head up, takes the first beat. Oh, my! Get that weak stuff out of here! Welcome back to the Junkyard Pod. I'm Tony Pesta, alongside my co-host Jackson Flickinger, and today we have a brand new co-host, a familiar face if you've been watching the pod. That would be Corey Walsh. Welcome to the pod. It's an absolute honor to be with the lads against Jackson's will. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely looking forward to watching you and Jackson form that bond that we all know is there. I'm dying for it. I think Jackson would rather <laughs> die, but I'm dying for the bond. So it wasn't against my will, but it wasn't Maybe it wasn't with my will. <laughs> <laughs> well, one way or another, Corey, uh, we're glad to have you. At least half of the original pod is glad to have you. I think Jackson, <laughs> yes. you can win him over throughout the season, hopefully. But today, I am glad to have going... you here, too, Corey. He is. So. He is. Wow. Today, we're going to take a short break, kind of, from talking just about the Cavs. We're going to be looking at the Eastern Conference and doing a tier list because everybody loves a good tier list. Everyone loves to hate on a tier list, of course. So uh, here's the way that I have it ranked. We're gonna be doing our favorites to win the Eastern Conference, followed by the teams who we think are the true contenders, uh, a little bit of wild cards, the teams who we think are basically a lock to be in the playoffs, then obviously the play-in tournament, and the teams who we think are just going to flat out suck and be in the lottery. Uh, we're choosing just to go over the Eastern Conference to keep this short and also just focus on keeping that Cavs angle into it uh, and just, you know, comparing them to the rest of the league. So uh, anything else, Jackson or Corey, that you want to say before we get started on this tier list? Uh, no, let's let's get started. I was hoping we were going to start with the uh, tie your own workout video, mm -hmm. but I guess we're saving that for the end. So we got to get through this in five minutes so we can devote the next 55 to that. Yeah, we're we're burying the lead a little bit because Ty Jerome new workout video dropped and it it really shocked the NBA world for a minute here. But we're gonna we're gonna get to that later. There's plenty of time to talk about Ty Jerome before we get into the season. But we might as well just start off with the the number one tier here and see if we are on in an agreement no, on we who we think is the, the favorite. You want to start, start at the bottom? At, yeah, yeah. Make a start start okay. getting to the end. Right. Okay. Never mind then. Uh, we'll start off with the lottery <laughs> team. Host? Should we? <laughs> Should we pick the team who we think is going to be the worst team in the East then? Just do the yes. opposite? Because yeah. I know who I'm going to pick personally. I feel like we might all be in agreement. Ooh. All right. Let's see. Do you want, should I start it or should we say it at the same time? Uh, I'll, I'll go one at the same time. time. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> let's go. Okay. On three. One, two, three. The Charlotte. Washington Wizards. I heard Charlotte. What did Corey yeah. say? Wizards. That was close. Listen, that Charlotte next. definitely next. Charlotte definitely belongs in there too. I actually have Washington and Charlotte back to back, but the reason that I thought Washington was worse is that even though they have definitely a higher floor, I think they have a lower ceiling as well because they just have a bunch of competent ish players. Like players, mm -hmm. if they were your tenth man on your roster, you'd be fine with. But if it's all tenth men and then Pool and Kuzma and like I think Tyus Jones is there now. Yeah. then I would I, I don't see them really like maybe they'll be one of those teams that starts five and five early in the year and everyone like the Wizards last year were the same way and everyone's like oh wait this seems kind of scrappy and then they just absolutely nosedive as the season goes along but Charlotte definitely has that youth upside where you don't really know what kind, you're going to necessarily get out of players yeah and I think uh, you know kind of a difference there too between Charlotte and Washington is that I feel like Charlotte wants to make the playoffs this year. I don't get the sense that they're going to be like trying to tank. Whereas the Wizards, what are they really playing for? I feel like they're, if any team is going to really, like you said, maybe start off good and then just completely plummet second half of the season with a cause to get into the lottery. I feel like it would be Washington. Charlotte could obviously do that too, but with the talent they have on the team, I think they are kind of uh, one of those franchises that want to be in the play-in at least and be more competitive, whereas Washington is definitely full in on the rebuild right now. My thing would be like Charlotte is more combustible, I think, because there's a mm. lot of factors that it's very hard to see it go right for their perspective. Like, obviously, their ceiling's not super high, but like you could just see like something going wrong with ball or, you know, just you can just see it blowing up pretty quickly. And it seems like that's kind of always the case with Charlotte. So that's why I have them lows where it feels like Washington's not going to blow up. They feel it feels like 
they have a vision for the first time in like seven, five, you know, five, six years. So it feels like they're just going to be steady bad and they're happy with it where like Charlotte could just explode. The only reason I put uh, Charlotte over is because they have an all-star possibility on their roster that could buoy some wins for them. But LaMelo also has been frequently injured in the past few seasons. So it's not even necessarily a guarantee he'll play like more than 55 games. LaMelo's in, in an all-star conversation just because of his name. I don't know. It just it just feels all empty, empty calories. Charlotte, Washington, I think put them right there. Uh, I think it's kind of yet to be seen if LaMelo is going to be a guy who actually impacts winning or if he's just kind of like a fun, exciting player who can do flashy things every now and then. So uh, we're all in agreement. Washington and Charlotte are near the bottom of the league. Who else would you put in there? I have a pick of mine if no one else wants to go, but... Uh, uh, the Pistons. You... Yeah, Pistons. the Pistons too. Yeah. Pistons going to the lottery. I think they have maybe i wouldn't want to say upside but maybe the highest ceiling of that group just because i do like kate cunningham if he returns and he's healthy and he has you know a little bit of a, a comeback season or maybe even like a breakout season i like wiseman the the pairing with uh marvin well, bagley's a, a little well, weird a warriors fan <laughs> yeah, of course the, <laughs> the two the two bigs there it's it's not even like the walmart version of allen and mobley it's like the dollar tree version but I do think Wiseman, someone who has maybe some untapped potential just as a rim runner, pair him with Cade Cunningham, that could be something. Uh, but they're probably going to be in the ladder. I can't see them really going too far. So can I put Alec Burke on my list of guys that I want the Cavs to trade for in the, uh, the trade deadline? It's, <laughs> it's never too early to do a um, trade deadline pod. I feel like this is the first time in a while that it feels like the Pistons are at least trying to build an actual team versus assembling prospects on a roster because I th I felt like their issue last year was between Ivy and Cunningham that they had just a lot of players that kind of wanted to drive to the paint and their bigs also didn't stretch the floor that much either so it was mm -hmm. just a lot of congestion and then you rely too much on Bogdanovich to kind of be the kick out option but now with multiple three point shooters kind of in house it feels like they're at least giving Cade and uh and and Ivy a recipe to kind of succeed. So that's why I don't have I, I'm kind of I wouldn't be surprised if they're in the play in conversation, but I also am not surprised if their name is going to be in the lottery again because their mm -hmm. draft pick is another one of those players in Thompson that is not going to spread the floor at all. He's another drive to the basket athletic freak kind of player. Yeah, so like I kind of see them as they're still like they don't know who the guys are besides like Cade. Because it's like Wiseman and Bagley. There's no universe where that's like a pairing that actually is something you'd think of if you want to like win basketball, at least both of them together. So I just kind of see them as like, hey, we're still trying to get guys, but we have to do something to show that we're kind of invested in this group. So, hey, let's get Joe Harris and, and a Bagdanovich. So it's just kind of like, I don't know, we, like we haven't seen enough from Kate to make me think that for offense. And it's like, yeah, Wiseman could take a jump, but... We've been waiting for the Wiseman jump for a while. Well, at least Tony has. I have like somewhat of a hot take. I'm thinking I'm more down on this team than most people, but I, mm. I'm pretty down on the Brooklyn Nets. I think. Ooh, okay. I think I don't really see them in the playing conversation. Just because if you look at their post KD Kyrie trade deadline, they were buoyed by those wins to get them into the play in. I think they played sub 500 basketball mm. around when they left afterwards so i mean i love mikhail bridges i think he's great i just don't think that roster is good enough that a great mikhail bridges season is going to put them in the play and i think there's more talented teams in the east overall from top to bottom they're very deep at wing but they're not deep i feel like anywhere else so that's why i kind of view them as a lottery team yeah i think that's fair uh i mean i had them in the play in but i feel like if there was a category between there that was just like bad they'd fit in perfectly <laughs> yeah that that sums it up i you know i'm a little higher on them than Corey. i would have had them in the play-in potentially i don't remember what my tier was before we started because uh this is my screen obviously and i had to reset it to get us going so i think i had them in the play-in there's a couple Could've teams that i'm like yeah, <laughs> the notepad man that's old school uh, <laughs> there's a couple teams that are just like on the bubble where it's like they could be a lottery team that could make the play-in does it even really matter i don't know but Mikhail Bridges, great two-way player, 
I don't know if he's if, if he'll be an all star or anything like that, but very solid player. I think losing Seth Curry, losing Watanabe definitely hurts them. Uh, but they still have Cam Johnson. They have some interesting guys on there. Didn't really Smith so, is on my trade deadline hopeful yeah, list. They just could be an annoying team to play, even if they're not a great one. They're not they're not a team that you're just going to steamroll every night. So I'll put them in lottery for now, and we can always change this as we go. There's another team that I I don't know if it would be a hot take or not that I kind of want to put in lottery. If uh, I'll just go for it and I'll say it. I kind of think the Raptors are not going to be very good this year. I don't think that's a hot take. Maybe lottery is a little too low on them. Uh, I had to decide about between that. the two. And I, I had Raptors in playoffs. Oh, okay. Oh. So big Siakam guy. Well, <laughs> Daddy Barnes. Like every big Yaka Purtle guy. So it felt like with with the with the Raptors, it felt like everything possibly that could go wrong did go wrong last year, mm-hmm. and they were 41 and 41. It's like I know they're not gonna have Van Fleet, but it's just like I think that there's enough baseline of talent there that if you like a new voice could be one of those things where it's like, Oh wow, this really like unlocks this group or like kind of gets them back on track because like before the season, I don't, I think people were definitely too high on them, but there was a reason why they were, if they're competent, you know, like if you, if you, if you have a structure in place that makes sense, it feels like they could just pick off a bunch of wins like like if you told me hey they're gonna they're gonna have 43 44 wins i wouldn't be shocked and i think that mm-hmm. may be enough to get you in the actual playoffs i feel like for the raptors i think the drop off for me was of van fleet to schroeder was what kind of impacted my decision i thought of them higher than the nets when i did this i had them at the play-in because i think the raptors have a really strong start four of the starting five and I think if, as long at like their recipe for success is if Scotty Barnes and Siakam can operate as primary ball handlers and have that kind of work, then that team could easily become a playoff team. But I kind of need to see Scotty Barnes rebound from last season because I felt like that was a very bad second season. I think he, Nick Nurse kind of kind of agitated that whole locker room. So I think players kind of lost their drive as the season went along. I mean, how many times do we read Bleacher Report articles of Siakam and Nick Nurse having an argument and then Siakam still suit up every single night and act like everything's fine. Mm -hmm. So I feel like as long as they can buoy the loss of Fred Van Fleet, then this team definitely could be a playoff team because the two teams that I have above them, I think could easily not be could easily be worse than the raptors at the end of the season yeah and they definitely like they definitely could explode but i just think that it felt like they exploded last year and nothing was working and it was like fan fleet wasn't really helping anything you know like he was getting his numbers but it felt like it was just kind of like there was just so much friction there that it's like maybe just moving the pieces around just is what they needed to kind of get the most out of their guys because they just, you know, like, I know that we don't like Scotty Barnes here around these parts, uh, but he's way better than what he was last year. And same with like Siakam. So it's just like, I think they have pieces to be a very stable, good basketball team through 82 games. So uh, maybe we can call I think I think play in. Mm, that's what compromise. I was gonna say. Is I think we'll concede. I could definitely see them being all the way in the playoffs, even as you said. I think part of it for me thinking that they might fall to the lottery is that there was so much dysfunction last year. And you know, obviously they did make they didn't really make moves, they just they lost people over the offseason. And so I just kind of wonder like at what point do they look at Siakam and think like it's time to move on and officially start a rebuild? I'm not sure if they're eager to do that. I'm not sure if that would come this season or if they would put it off because they haven't made many moves since winning the championship. They've kind of just stuck with what they have. Uh, but Siakam's a great player. Their starting five is good. Barnes uh, did have a sophomore slump, but that's not exactly uncommon for players. Like he could have a bounce back season. And if any, if a couple of those things break right for them, they're definitely a play-in team and they could be a just straight up playoff team. If- I mean, Masai Ujiri, I feel like you literally have to like 
show him like 10 reasons why something isn't working for him to break something up. I mean, that Raptors team, they just ran into a wall like four seasons in a row. And we're like, oh, next year we'll get him. And then eventually it was like, no, we got to like yank the cord on this. So they could easily be stubborn again and just go headstrong this season too. Even if like teams real, I know Siakam and OG would probably garner the most trade attention from other teams. So when we, cause we're going to talk about all these other teams in the playing category, like the Pacers, magic bulls like i just i think they're so much more competent than all those franchises can't just like pencil the magic in for like well we know they're gonna win x amount of games just because of the skill that they have in these categories so anyways yeah no that'd be weird (laughs) (laughs) well on that note we should just talk let's just lump those three teams that you mentioned together the pacers the magic and the bulls because i'd have to assume that kind of rounding out this lottery play in and final playoff spot there these are probably the three teams we all have uh near the bottom there uh is there is there anyone differing from that uh potentially yeah. yes <laughs> okay. well, let's start off with that let's see what what do you have down there i to round out my play in spots i have the uh, the bulls and i also have the atlanta hawks as my play okay. spots i'm that's, much lower that's what i figured hawks it would be the consensus. hawks <laughs> I, yeah but no jackson please oh uh, well I, I was just gonna say just like i think it'd be surprising if they were a play-in team like again would that kind of surprise you i mean i know that i know that trey young you're never gonna have a good defense with trey young but it's like a full year of, of quinn snyder it just felt like they were like at the end of the year it felt like they were kind of going in the right direction maybe it's me me putting too much stock in like how they finish the year and like their little series against the uh, Celtics, but it just felt like they were on the right track in a way that they weren't in like December and January. I feel like for me, what makes me feel like it's not just going to work out as well is just, I don't really like the Murray and Trey young pairing. I don't think it makes a lot of basketball sense. I feel like when they did that trade, it was like the Hawks decided they wanted to take that next step. And they look, like looked on the market for available stars, and they came to the conclusion that Murray was the best player available at the time. I bet if Donovan Mitchell, I bet if they knocked the door on the Donovan Mitchell trade, and you asked them, "Hey, would you rather have Donovan Mitchell with Trey Young or <laughs> or uh, Dejounte Murray?" I think every ten out of ten times they would have regretted that trade and immediately would have done those same exact assets for Donovan Mitchell. Quinn Snyder is a fantastic coach and he could easily, if any coach is going to make that guard pairing kind of work, it would be him. But offensively, I just don't really like their fit. And defensively, John Collins was also good. And I don't know why his name was thrown into trade discussions every two seconds as if he was the reason why that team wasn't working. But I don't know what their solution is going to be. Like, I don't really necessarily know what their starting five is really going to look like this upcoming season. So, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're a playoff team either because the two teams I have above them are unproven. And it's just me kind of assuming it, things are going to go fall right for them and then fall right wrong for Atlanta. So there's really not a lot of fact behind my opinion. <laughs> I think it's just kind of, you can be skeptical about all those all of those things, but that's why we don't think they're going to be like a top four team in the East, as opposed to like, that's why, yeah, I could, there could be the fifth, sixth team in the East. And that's not really like, it's not surprising. I have the Hawks uh, firmly in the playoffs for me personally. I like Jackson is saying, I, I wouldn't put them up there with the better teams in the East, but Hey, Trey young, just for whatever reason, he manages to win basketball games. I've never been the biggest Trey fan. I think he's probably like the worst defender in the NBA. I think a lot of his stats are a bit inflated because of, you know, he has the ball in his hands all the time. But at the end of the day, like, I can't I can't sit here and pretend that he doesn't win basketball games. The DeJounte Murray pairing didn't work out last season. I wonder if year two of that will look any better. Did start to put it together a little bit. Like, that team seemed like it was trending in the right direction. I like uh, a Kong where I like A.J. Griffin off their bench. They have a lot of guys who I just think uh, I'm a fan of, and I could see them being a playoff team pretty easily. The other teams that we have kind of on the bubble here, uh, Orlando, Chicago, and Indiana. Of that group, I also had Indiana in the playoffs. And then really, 
the Magic and the Bulls, if you want to put them in the play-in or the lottery, either way, it doesn't matter to me. I think the Magic are the more exciting team. They have a lot of youth. They have a lot of exciting young players who, depending on how quickly they put it together or how big of a leap, you know, Ben Carroll makes or anything like that, Franz Wagner, like, they could be a play they could be a playoff team. I could see Orlando getting all the way into the playoffs. I'll just go ahead and fill this out a little bit and you guys can kind of tell me how you feel about it. You need to make your case for the Pacers in the playoffs. Okay. In that, in that tier, just because it's like, what do you what do they do that the Raptors don't? <clears throat> you know? Um, I just think uh, again, as I kind of said before, I think like the Pacers they want to make the playoffs. This is a team that like very clearly you need to see some success. Toronto is a team that I feel like is just kind of in this weird like purgatory space where it's probably in their best interest if they just go into the lottery and try to rebuild. Whereas I feel like Indiana is like, hey, we have Halliburton. We have Benedict Matherin. We just signed Obi Toppin. We added Bruce Brown. I just don't know if Toronto is going to be as motivated. They were dysfunctional last season. I just don't know if they're going to be able to get into the playoffs as I have more faith in Indiana getting there. I just think they're young and hungry and they feel like they have something to prove. And I just like a lot of the guys on that team. I think you can say everything that you said about the Raptors, but the Raptors have a track record of actually doing it. Whereas the Pacers don't, it's That's like fair. the Raptors, they have a new head coach that has something to prove. They have guys on their team that want to make the playoffs too. If they um didn't, they wouldn't have, you know, they would have pulled the plug on this. So it's like, mm -hmm. I just see the rappers as having more of a baseline of talent, but like the Pacers are a more say. exciting team. Like it's like, yeah, you know, they're more fun to talk about than I think the Raptors are right now. So I think that's kind of like the bias that like teams like them and the magic get where it's like, yeah, the magic are fun. So mm -hmm. we're going to overrate them as opposed to a team like even if, even a team like the Bulls, where it's like they're not yeah. fun, you know, we have no idea what they're doing, like what direction they want to take, but they also have very competent players on mm. their team. Yeah, I guess in a way, this is kind of just like the teams that I want to be in the playoffs because the Pacers are just more fun. I know what the Raptors can do. I've right. seen it before. I know That's... what DeMar DeRozan's going to do in the play and in the playoffs. Let me see this fresh batch of players. The Bulls are a mess, man. I feel so bad for them because they they're not they're not never going to be bad enough to get a good lottery pick unless the, the balls just fall right for them. And they're never going to be good enough to where you think they're going to be a sneaky threat in the playoffs either, either with like a first round upset. Their best case scenario is they give you a really competitive first round game and then they just go off into the sunset and start the year the same exact way that it was the year before. And I have to defend the magic a little bit <laughs> because I had <laughs> no, them. You don't. As, um, they're my playoff team, Jackson. So I have to defend the lads from Orlando. I think I'm a, I fell exactly into what Jackson said, where I'm more, I, I feel like this is my, Hey, I think this team's going to be really fun. And I'd rather see them in the playoffs mm -hmm. than a, a boxing match with the Toronto Raptors <laughs> and whatever game comes out of that. And I think I really, I think what's kind of solidified it for me is I think Wagner is still going to be the best player on that team. I don't think Boncaro is going to be their best player going into this year, but Boncaro and Wagner as a one-two combination is very interesting to me. And I think that alone has a higher, it, it has, has the capabilities of being as equal as high of a ceiling as the uh, Scotty Barnes Siakam combo, but that might be a hot take on my end. So I'm with it. I love the hot takes. Everyone does this thing where every year, everyone's a year early on the team that's up and coming. And I feel like that's the same thing with the Pacers and Magic right now, where it's like they don't in teams like that, they don't have the baseline level of like veteran skill or like competence in every position to actually win a lot of these games where it's like it seems like they just lose games that they don't have to and so that's where it's like i just see like the bulls it's like i think their floors like the 10th seed and i think their ceilings like the ninth seed where it's like yeah like we know what we have know what we're getting we're getting a team that has skill but it just doesn't have a direction so whereas like the magic have a direction they just don't have the baseline level of competence so they definitely don't have the depth of a playoff team i think i think right. they have their starting five 
on a night to night basis should win a decent amount of games, but they'll lose because their bench just will con consistently shoot them in the foot. Like, I don't think they have a, a competent backup guard. I'm not high on Jalen Suggs at all. Mm -hmm. And I think Markel Fultz is a very solid point guard. I think he'll help stabilize that offense because he's like a true point guard in the sense like he's not hunting for a shot. He is pretty good at his court vision. He should find good looks for the rest of the guys. But the minute the bench comes on the floor, I would expect whatever lead the starting five could create for them, it will be gone in an instant. So it's going to really be up to them. They could easily be the thunder of last year where everyone penciled them in immediately. And then they quickly were like, oh, wait, um, this isn't 2K, where you just put the highest potential rated players in. But then in a year, you have five 90s on your roster and everything's great we basically have the plan lottery oh, locked in playoffs a team disagreement the knicks are a playoff here, team the knicks are awesome in team. there i'd agree with that too. Would it, i'd agree with because like i would probably put them for ranking they're yeah, highest for sure playoff yeah team yeah they're like as close as you can get to being like in that contender tier while still being like a step below if you get what i'm saying and i don't even mean that as a diss i just mean i just don't know if they have the high-end star power to really be anything other than just a very annoying team that you have to play in the playoffs, a team that's going to get not dirty, but they're going to make the game a mess. They're going to outwork you out hustle as we saw against the Cavs. But as in terms of actually getting all the way to the conference finals or anything like that, I just don't think they have the star power necessary. And that's really all I have to say about it. I just wasn't in love with their offseason moves. I didn't feel like they really addressed any of they the didn't do much at all. They added Dante DiVincenzo just to complete mm. the Villanova trio. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that was just a, uh, hey, let's make uh, Jalen Brunson as happy as possible. So let's bring back Josh Hart, which they had to do because he was so valuable to them last season anyway. But then Dante DiVincenzo, I felt like that was... It's hard to tell what's an overpay these days with the NBA mm -hmm. contracts, but I looked at that contract and I wasn't necessarily thinking that was good value. I feel like you could have got the same skill set for a lot cheaper without the name, pretty much. I think people still look at DiVincenzo as a young asset that like will grow over time. I think he's pretty capped out at what he's going to be. It's going to be the mm -hmm. same spread the floor, three point shooter that you've seen over the past few years at multiple spots and the Knicks offense. It's not going to be one where I feel like it's going to make the Vincenzo look any better. It might actually make him look worse just because of the way their offense is so ISO heavy, I feel like, with their mm -hmm. guards. And I, I'm, I, but I've been in on RJ Barrett, but I'm, I think I'm, I'm out. I think I know exactly what <laughs> he's going to be. I think I know exactly what he's going to I was the last person, I feel like, on RJ Barrett Island. He might have I've been, sold man. my stock and I, I'm moving on. <laughs> I'm moving elsewhere. Got to cut you your like, losses at some point. Did you get like three Canadian dollars for that? Like, I think your stock buyouts. <laughs> I think I'm getting audited by the Canadian government. For <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I will say about the Knicks, because I we we love talking about the Knicks. Um, love them. I feel like there's like the Tom Thibodeau cycle where like they've reached the other part of the cycle where like I feel like the cycle is like nobody nobody believes in us. We're gonna out hustle everyone. We're going to get the most out of our players. And then like, once you get to that part, it's like expectations. And then we're going to, things are going to go bad. People are going to get tired of playing 42 minutes a game. Mm. Everyone's angry. Then they're going to have a bad season. Nobody, nobody believes in us. Then they're right back to where they were. So I feel like I'm not saying they're going to have a bad season, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were like a six, seven, eight seed in that in that realm more than in like the four five three i also feel like their season is too predic like the, how good they're gonna be is too predicated on which of julius randall are they gonna get because exactly I, I or as annoying as a player as he is he completely determines their season every single year because if he's bought in he looks great their their offense becomes infinitely better because it will give jalen brunson someone else to kind of share the load with but if he's awful and it's all on jalen brunson the knicks fans are immediately going to start asking the question of why did we let obi toppin go for nothing and then just keep julius randall when we could have just shoveled him off to one of these awful teams that would have just taken the cap hit in exchange for some draft picks and it depends on the bench because they're yeah. really reliant on their bench to win the minutes that they're playing. Um, 
And it's like, if that bench unit works, then it's like, okay, you can see them pulling out a bunch of wins. If it doesn't, you know, without Obi Toppin, then, you know, don't want to oversell Toppin's value because he's not like a game changing player. But when you have a bench unit, it's all about like fit. So it's like, does this bench unit fit without him? It's kind I feel of my like concern. It's fair to say that Toppin is the Grant Williams of what the, to the Celtics type of player for them mm -hmm. like he was never a player that you really wanted to start but when he was in the, the game he made a huge difference i feel like he was way better in that cab series than julius randall was by an absolute mile i felt like nick i saw a lot of knicks fans kind of hoping that they were going to eventually just make the swap for the two of them at some point in the series but you know tibbs loves his guys so that's the excuse tibbs usually rolls out when we see Taj Gibson's corpse playing like 20 <laughs> minutes a game for those Timberwolves teams. So moving along here, I have two teams in my wild card tier. Uh, mm -hmm. How many do you guys have there? I have two. three. Three. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm just going to take a guess that we all have this team in our wild card tier. Yes. Yep. <laughs> and it's basically just the Damian Lillard sweepstakes. Like if they add Dame, I don't know where I'd put them. Would I put them in contender? Would I put them as the favorite? It kind of depends on the package. Even if you take Dame out of the equation, I mean, they were the eight seed last year and they go all the way to the finals. So I just literally don't know what to tell you about the Heat. They could be a playing team. They were a playing team last year. They could be top three in the East for all I know. A lot of it depends on the Dame trade, but even without that, there's just so much variance to where their season could go for a billion different reasons most of which just Jimmy Butler turning into Michael Jordan whenever he needs it. So, like, I don't know where to put them, so I'm just putting them in the wild card tier. One thing I will say is I'd be surprised if they had a great regular season, basically under any circumstances. Like, you know, you know they traded for Dame. I don't see them having, like, a 50-win regular season. What I do see them, what is, like, harder to forecast is, like, their playoff success. Uh, just because you can see a world where they do have playoff success, even if they don't have regular season success, because we've seen it repeatedly. I feel like the regular season is going to be trying to find out who's going to replace those Max Struess and Gabe Vincent minutes and kind of figuring out what their bench is going to look like. I feel like their starting five is mostly going to be unchanged throughout the whole season they'll just pick their five josh richardson should probably fill one of those two spots pretty admirably i think josh richardson's i think him not being the player that he was forecasted to be after his first stint with miami kind of hurt his stock around the league but he's always been a, a very solid player he was actually a player i wanted on the Cavs after the during the free agent um uh, period but yeah, I agree with Jackson exactly. I think they're just going to try to figure out what their 6 through 10 looks like without uh, key losses in the offseason, but they're easily... I, you can't count out Spolstra. He literally makes everything work once it comes to postseason time. He'll know what buttons to push with this roster. And if they upset a team by being like a 6 or 7 seed in the East again, would any of us be truly surprised anymore at this point? Right. Hmm. Yeah, one thing one thing I will say is if they do make the uh, Dame trade, they're going to have no depth and they hmm. and their depth already took a big hit with just free agency. So it's like, are they a better regular season team if they make the trade? Like, I don't even know. Uh, they're definitely a better postseason team, but it's just, you know, it's just hard managing a group that's that old when your best players are kind of like, Butler and Lillard, presumably, you know, they're just older people, like older guys. You don't really want to be playing them 40 minutes a game to win games. Spolstra knows that. So I, I just see them kind of punting a bunch of like long road trips. <laughs> yeah, that's the big concern for Miami is the depth. Uh, they lost some just through free agency. And if they do make the Dame trade, there goes even more of their depth. So unless they find, you know, four undrafted guys who are just amazing NBA players, apparently. Uh, that's going to be a concern for them all season. Something that I forgot to mention when we talk about the Knicks, a true game changer here is they did sign Dylan Windler. So keep an eye out for that. There Ooh. is the possibility they could move up this tier list if, uh, you know, never heard Dylan of Windler. <laughs> oh, he's a Cleveland legend, actually. But, but yeah, uh, Miami, basically the definition of a wild card. The other team that I have in the wild card tier, I'm going to go ahead and put him in there the philadelphia 76ers for me would you guys agree with that 
yep, we have no idea what's happening with James Harden. <laughs> um, the Cavs I, should also be in the wild card tier. I had them in the wild card tier. I you actually had Philly. In, yeah, and I had Philly in contenders. Ooh. I don't okay. think you not have I, I had the Cavs in contenders and then obviously Philly in the wild card. And Philly's in the wild card almost like for a different reason than Miami, where it's like Miami's a wild card because they could be really, really good or they could enter the playoffs as an eight seed. Philadelphia is a wild card in, in the way of like, I literally just don't know what they're doing. I don't know what's going to happen with James Harden. I don't think Joel Embiid is going to be very pleased with the way this season is going to go with how it's lining up. The added Kelly Oubre Jr., who, again, I don't think Joel Embiid is going to be very pleased (laughs) on a random night in January when they lose a close game and Oubre is one for eight from downtown. Like I could just see that situation turning into chaos so quickly. But if they somehow manage to keep it together even just a little bit, there's so much talent on that team they could be in the contender tier. So it's hard to really pinpoint where they're going to be, but I do think they're kind of dangling over the edge of a cliff and James Harden is like pushing the whole team off the edge. It feels like Embiid really values the regular season more than any other superstar out there. Just from the perspective that he wants to get all the accolades he can, and he's good enough to win a lot of games on his own. So I don't even care who they put out there. I see them having a lot of regular season success even if james harden isn't there uh, my concerns are all in the uh, playoffs so basically they're like the inverse of the heat where like i'd be surprised if the sixers kind of you know got to the second round or did well in the second round i i would be shocked i i'm not going to be shocked if they win 50 games because Embiid's a monster and is playing 82 games or trying to play as many games as possible playing heavy minutes so that's where i see them in the wild card tier yeah i I agree with that for sure uh well i guess let's talk about the Cavs. you guys both had them in wild card i would have put them in contenders just because and i guess just to clarify when i say contenders i mostly just mean like contenders to win the east i wouldn't say that the Cavs are title contenders but I could see the Cavs winning the Eastern Conference, if, uh, and obviously I'm a biased Cavs fan, but putting them in wild card seems fair because, as we saw last season, second best net rating in the NBA, and they go out in five games to the New York Knicks. So wild card seems fair for them. I think they have a very high ceiling and a lower floor than I think any of us would really wish for this team. I think that wild card is the right place for them and they should be in the contenders slash favorites to win the East. They have enough skill on the um, roster. It's just kind of, can they maximize that skill? Cause it felt like throughout the season, they were never maximizing the skill. Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell's best games came when the other one was off the floor. Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, like Jared Allen got played off multiple times against like the Celtics or like didn't get played off against the Bucks, but he should have been played off just because not able to get out to shooters. So it's like, I don't have a question about their ability in the um, regular season, just having that baseline level of defense coming back to like the mad, like conversation with the magic and Pacers. It's like, if you have something to hang your hat on that you are going to be one of the best in the league at, you're going to win a ton of games and the Cavs have that. Uh, I think they're going to, you know, try to win as many games as possible. So I think they will. I wouldn't be, I would be more surprised if the Cavs were the four seed than I would be if they were the one seed. Uh, So it's like, I think they're going to win a ton of games. It's just in the playoffs. Nothing that we saw last year makes you believe that regular season success can translate to the playoffs unless they're able to show that they can play four out, that they're able to show that the shooting, that there is space, that they figure out the Isaac Okoro problem, that they figure out the Jared Allen, Evan Mobley problems in the um, half court. If they do that, then it's like, yeah, there's no reason why they can't win the East. But if they don't, then it's like they, they can win 55 regular season games and just lose in the second round to a team that's not better than them. Yeah, yeah we were Cavs... doing this. Oh, sorry, Corey. I, I'll go. be really quick. I just—I was just going to say, uh, if we were doing this by like regular season success, I would probably have the Cavs at the top. I think they have a very good chance of finishing with the best record in the East. Huh. But since we're counting for the playoffs, I'll, I'll put them in wild card. 
Yeah, no, I just was saying I agree with Jackson. I think they have too many reasons why things don't work for me to kind of put them in the contenders tier because I feel like there's still a lot of things that while working, I don't think they're where they should be necessarily. And I want to see how that kind of plays out through the season. I think there's a lot of questionable pairings that we kind of want to see what a second year will do for each, whether it's the front court or the back court. And I want to see if the off season additions kind of make a difference for allowing the offense to play more free and less rigid than it seemed like in the prior season. I really want the Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell pairing to, to succeed. And I agree with Jackson that I felt like it one worked in spite of the other, whenever their best games were on, it never felt like the both of them were kind of co-driving at the same time. It was just your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn. And I don't want this Cavs team to feel like the James Harden, Chris Paul Rockets, where they're never going to be able to both succeed at the highest level. It's one has to sacrifice in order for the other to be at their best. Because Darius Garland, I feel like, is the X factor for me for this Cavs team this year. If he wants to take the next step and be more aggressive, which has always kind of been his issue. I feel like even though he can score a high scoring games it never feels like he's always like he never can like i feel like he doesn't shift his mentality to that alpha scoring mentality very often and we see flashes of it and we think it's gonna stick and it just regresses back to him being a selfless basketball player which works in most offenses but the for the cast to succeed offensively this year he really kind of needs to shift that mindset permanently i think it's right to have garland as the x factor but i'm going to disagree as to why I don't think Garland really has the like the body type to be like a dominant on ball just scorer where like if you're that small and you're not able to like he's not really good at creating contact like like am um, Trey Young is and he he doesn't have like the willingness to just shoot pull up shots like that to ever really like be like a Damian Lillard type guy. So it's like, I just don't see him as being like that dominant, like ball first guy. But if one of them decides that they want to play off ball in any capacity, besides just standing kind of spacing stuff out, then it's like this whole duos can, you know, it's like un unlocked. And neither one of them have shown that they want to do that or that they can do that. So it's like, if Garland wants to be a good off ball player, then everything opens up. If Donovan Mitchell wants to be an off ball player, then everything opens up. Yeah, I think the, no, I, I think, oh, go <laughs> this ahead. <is> so us, <laughs> no, you go first. I think, I think the best version of the Cavs is Donovan Mitchell with the ball in his hands as much as possible. And for that to happen, he needs to grow as a um, playmaker. And for that to really work, uh, Darius Garland needs to be an elite off-ball player. And they've kind of shown glimpses of being able to do both, but none, but neither have really tried to do either. So that's where that's one of those things where it's like until they can figure that out, then it's still going to be weird. And the your turn, my turn doesn't work as well because Darius Garland isn't Chris Paul and Donovan Mitchell is not James Harden. Yeah, I was going to, I pretty much was going to say what you're going to say, where like Garland showed flashes of being off ball with his catch and shoot ability while on the move, but it was just so few and far between that you felt like the Leonardo DiCaprio meme, just him pointing at the TV every time it happened. And then you're like, oh my God, this is going to be some revolutionary moment for them. And then it just quickly was like, oh, we only did that in that one instance and we won't show it for like eight more games. That's cool. <laughs> it's, I always hate comparing. It's tough to compare teams that aren't all time level to teams that are. So I'm going to evoke Tony's favorite team here. But like <laughs> the Warriors make a bunch of non shooting lineups work because of their movement off ball. And Darius Garland is not in the same world that Steph Curry is in. Same with like Clay Thompson, but the Cavs have really good bigs that have a lot more gravity going to the basket than the Warriors ever had. So it's like, 
if you could find ways to have a off ball two man game with Allen and Garland or Mobley and or a Mobley and Garland, then it's like everything just opens up and then you have Max Struess out there as well, just being the threat that he is. So it's like there's a world where you can see it. It's just, is there a world that you can see JB being able to put it into play and they have the buy-in from Garland and Mitchell? That's where it's like, I don't, that's what I have a harder time saying. Yeah, I think the JB aspect is where I really focus on with the off-ball movement because I, I don't, I'm not as concerned about Garland at least buying into any of that. Mitchell maybe a little more it would take convincing, but I think both of them would easily buy into kind of this more off-ball movement-centric offense, whereas I just question if JB has that in him, if he's really capable of drawing up something like that and like getting the team, getting a system that's going to work fluidly like we see in Golden State. Uh, you know, Max Struess is someone I think will be a good kind of bar to use as a, as a test for this team because in Miami, he was moving off ball like crazy. He was constantly running around screens, dribble handoffs. He was one of the best cutters in the NBA. So if he comes into this Cleveland offense and we see him standing in the corner, we see him standing off ball, not really moving, that's going to be an, ind an indictment on JB in my eyes. And I think that if this team's going to work, a big aspect of it is getting Garland and Mitchell to both move off ball more and be just just get this offense to feel like it's an actual system running rather than one guy just kind of taking on a whole team and then making a play out of that himself. They need to really have more of a team effort, more chemistry and just more fluidity across the court with everyone on the floor. One thing I will say is that like movement breeds movement. So the more guys you have moving, the easier it is for additional guys to move. And it's a lot harder to make Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell move when they're paired with Isaac Okoro or Karis LeVert, who are not guys who are good off ball movers. Um, so it's like, there's a lot of reasons why, and there's kind of, there's room there to cut JB some slack, but it's like, if you have Max Struess and it doesn't work, then it's like, then we can't, it's hard to even go down the Allen and Mobley route for too long because it's like, if the, if they can get movement in the half court, then it's like Allen and Mobley can work because we know they can work on the defensive end, or at least we think they can if they cover shooters. Mm. So, yeah, I think uh... to that. I, I think we talk about the Cavs enough. We we do this all day, every day. Let's we are a Cavs into, podcast, Tony. <laughs> I know. That's I what know. we are. Let's, let's get to the final two teams here. Uh, I don't know if we agree on this or not, but we have the Milwaukee Bucks and the Boston Celtics are our final two teams. One of them is going to be the favorite to win the East. The other one is going to go in the contender tier. Corey, we'll list. start with you. Not on your list. Okay, we'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have to work that one yeah, out then. We'll <laughs> I'll, I'll start with Corey. Who do you have at just – where do you put Boston? Where do you put Milwaukee here? This is really not going to help my uh, the, the roasting Jackson's done for me, but the Celtics <laughs> are my favorite to win the East. And I think that's a shock. I know, you know, I'm such a big Boston fan, you know, love the Celtics. Don't despise Go Patriots. Them. Well, it's we're own two, you know, times are tough. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, no, and then I have boss, I have Milwaukee in the contenders. I feel like Milwaukee is regressing in front of our eyes and Giannis's eyes, and I just mm -hmm. feel like there's too much smoke going around with this team. It doesn't seem like vibes are that high that they're trying to recruit Giannis to stay. Giannis has usually come off as a very loyal guy. And even he's kind of being like in a, his own way, being like, yeah, I'm not going to like, you know, commit to anything, trying to do like the LeBron route of proof to me why you want me to stay. But it seems like he really wants a reason to leave more than a reason to stay. And I think he just sees that Drew Holiday is an older player. Chris Middleton's not necessarily going to be on the floor all the time. He's just very injury prone. And if he's like, if, if you're two co-stars that you share the floor with and are supposed to help you carry your team to a title are kind of regressing, then I feel like Giannis is like, it's really him. And I don't really love their role players that much. I know it's like they succeeded last year and their roster is pretty much unchanged. But if I didn't love their team last year and it kind of fell flat, then why am I expecting this year's going to be any different? Like Giannis is going to be a top five player in the league, but what else am I getting out of this roster? And 
The Celtics, for me, I know it's going to be ugly for them to start. You rip out the heart and soul of their team with Marcus Smart. You put in a banged-up injury pro and Kristaps Porzingis, who shortly after, he's your big chip of why we're shaking up this roster. He goes, hey, guys, by the way, I have plantar fasciitis, so <laughs> suck on that. <laughs> They're all just like, oh, yeah, no, that's cool. Malcolm Brogdon already wants to leave because his name was thrown in a trade and then revoked. It's like, oh, we didn't mean that. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. We hit the wrong name by accident. And I, I just think that the Brown and Tatum pairing is enough that I like that nucleus more than just Giannis and hoping that Drew Holiday stays at the same level a year older and that Chris Middleton is going to be on the floor. And do we really have to, you know, I, mean, I know Matt Ishba gets like a lot of shit from everywhere else, but I'm, I think Mike Boonholzer, that title bought him way more time than he probably should have had. I don't think Boonholzer, when it comes to playoff time, is going to save anyone. And at the end of the day, I I just I think the Celtics are a much more solid bet to make the, the finals in the East than the Bucks are. Corey, I would like to thank you for not using your Boston accent when you do these podcasts. It's you know, really, I try to really nice. shake it out. You know, thank it's you. hard, but anything for you guys. And you drink your Duncan off screen, you know. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. <laughs> just, just wearing my, my Patriots shirt on the side. Um, so I agree with everything that you say about the um, Bucks. It's why they are not in my favorites to win the East. And I have no favorites because the top of the East is awful. Like, I think it's fair to say that. There's no... All these teams are um, fatally flawed. I think, I think the Celtics are like we know who they are they have their issues and it feels like for them to be the best version of themselves tatum and brown have to be the best versions of themselves and it's not that i don't believe in the pairing but i don't believe that either one of them really wants to look in the mirror and improve in the areas that are holding them back and until they do that it's like i just don't you're just you're just moving the pieces around two guys that I don't think really like understand why they're falling short in these in these situations. So that's why a team like Miami, who was severely not as talented, is able to go in and you know go to the finals. The same with um, the Bucks. So it's like the door's wide open for anybody. Uh, these teams just aren't very good, and they're and they're going in the wrong direction. I think both teams are going to be worse. Yeah, I you know in a weird way, I kind of feel like the Cavs are the only team in this grouping that like actually improved in the summer. I I, I would say at least with the additions of Struess and Yang, like uh, so I had Milwaukee as my favorites. I do uh, kind of agree it's pretty wide open. I could see Boston making it. I could see Miami making it. As we have said. Uh, I guess with Milwaukee, the concern is you could kind of have like a 2018 LeBron Cavs type situation where like, you know, Giannis is gone and the vibes might not all be there, but if you can put it all together, those guys have proven they can win together. And if they're healthy and if Giannis is able to give you enough motivation to be like, Hey, I'm here. If you can prove to me that we can win a championship, maybe I'm going to stay. Then maybe they get all the way to the finals. Uh, Using that as a motivation typically doesn't seem to work in the NBA. It just kind of kills the entire vibes. But I still, I, I think Giannis is by far the best player in the Eastern Conference. So that's kind of where I get my pick here. The Celtics, I just, like, I was never even a big Marcus Smart guy to begin with. This might be a weird comparison, but hopefully you'll be able to get what I'm saying. Is he kind of always gave me like Russell Westbrook energy where it's like, I can't deny yes. that he is helping the team a lot but he's also hurting the team a lot. And I could just never really tell, like, is it a net positive that he's having on the team or is he holding them back? And I think it's all at once somehow. But with that said, this is a team that kind of uh, gets criticism for being mentally weak. I think Tatum and Brown, Jackson said it perfectly. It's like they're not really understanding why they're not getting there. And Marcus Smart is the guy who was going to hold everyone accountable. And you ask Celtics fans, he was the heart and soul of that team. So you lose him for... Chris Stops, who I'm just not very big on Chris Stops. I think a lot of last season ignored the injury concerns. I think a lot of last season he's on a just an empty stat season where he's on a team that just kind of stinks and he has free reign to do whatever he wants. 
I'm not, I want to, you know, give him a little bit of credit because I sound like I'm incredibly low on him. I think he does raise their ceiling if he's healthy and if he's playing up to that level. That's a really good player to add to your team. And it's a really interesting dynamic. But the thing for me is like they already had, you know, four spacing big men. They had Grant Williams, Al Horford's a quality center. I feel like they traded arguably their best playmaker, which is what I felt like they were missing the most was another ball handler and a playmaker for something that they already had on their roster. And I just don't think it made them better. But uh, Tatum and Jalen Brown are both talented enough to get you there to the finals alone. So it, it's it's really, it's just a wide open Eastern Conference. I feel like the Celtics saw a problem. The issue for them is that, like, they, their solution was, hey, I didn't like how Marcus Smart was our primary ball handler. That didn't really work out. Why didn't it work out? He wasn't looking for others. How about we move Derek White to that position who is a little less selfish, but he's not really a true point guard. And our bigs were fine in the postseason, but let's just add another. And we'll see how that if that solves all of our problems. Now there's just more mouths to feed with Kristaps on the floor. When Robert Williams was your starting five, he was not commanding the ball at all. And now you're going to have three players who all think they're capable of scoring 20 plus points a game. And Derek White is now going to become a. I feel like he's going to have to take a step back from being a complimentary offensive player to then his main role is now going to have to be to set up for others because he was good as the starting point guard in two postseason games. I feel, I mean, they, I said this last year, I felt like they were one Ricky Rubio away from solving their problems. Not in the sense that Ricky Rubio of last year, but that type of player mm -hmm. would make this team infinitely better because they just need someone whose main objective is to get the ball open for others. Well, that's what Brogdon was supposed to do. And now, He's angry and wants out. So well, don't throw his name in trades. <laughs> <Then we're laughs> them. Well, it's it's like all these problems. So if you want to take the optimistic view, it's like this roster is forcing Jason Tatum to look in the mirror and say, "I have to be the ball handler. I have to get everyone involved. I have to be the best version of myself." The same with um, Brown. But if you want to say, "Hey," they've shown us a million times that they don't really want to improve in those areas, then it's like they're not taking a step forward by getting rid of the guy that seemed like was holding everything together. So that's where it's like, I don't, I don't really believe in them. And it's like kind of the transition off of it. But like, I don't see, I don't know if Giannis is going to age well. Like he is, I know he's still in his prime, so he still has he's going to be good this year but it's like his athleticism is going to keep going down and it seems like he's never added anything to his game that's going to really offset that and i think a really interesting point to look at is like 2014 2015 lebron where it seemed like he was taking a real step back once he turned 30 and came back to the Cavs, and he really kind of struggled that season trying to find how he was going to like be the best player despite losing some of his explosiveness and then obviously i think he became an even better player than he was in 16 17 and 18. um so does he can Giannis do that can he do it on a worse team that's not built around him the same way so it's like there's a lot of question marks with both of those teams that if we had this conversation at the beginning of last year, those weren't there because we thought, hey, Brogdon's going to fix all these problems for the for the Celtics and the Bucks should still be just as good as they were. So that's where it's like, I just don't trust either team. All right. Well, before we go, uh, Jackson, I do. I, I can't let you do a cop out. You do have to pick someone to be your favorite. If you just had to bet on someone, I know you don't trust either of the teams, but we need to put it in stone so we can come back at the end of the year and figure out if you were right or wrong. I want to put in stone that all these teams suck and <laughs> it should be like, it really should be the Cavs, but it's also like, you can't trust them. Uh, I'd say, I'd say the Celtics, say just. Be, I'd say the if Celtics, that's what you're feeling. no, I'd say the Celtics <laughs> just because they have the most competence. And even though they're, they, they have 0% chance of winning the finals. Um, 
they seem like the one that's going to be less injury prone. And yeah, Porzingis and Brogdon never get hurt. Well, <laughs> neither one of them matter. Like, in, how like, dare you? Oh, well, wow. I'm just saying, and like, what Boston the Celtics is coming for you now? For the Those Celtics, are all in move. <laughs> right, but for the Celtics, like the best version of the Celtics, they just need Brown and Tatum out there on the floor, beating the corpse of Brooke Lopez and <laughs> Drew Holiday and. While the Cavs Walter are, Middleton. while the Cavs are like triple teaming, you know, Al Al Horford <laughs> for no reason, you know, just things like that. Like I just see the Celtics, like they have, they could blow up, but they seem to have the less, like the least amount of combustibility when compared That's to all the other combustible it. teams. <laughs> Yeah, well, you guys outvoted me two to one there. So I put the Celtics at the top, favorites to win the East. Uh, overall, I think we were mostly in agreement for this tier list. So uh, thank you guys for doing this. Uh, of course, thank you everyone for watching or listening. Subscribe on Apple or Spotify or YouTube if you want to see video versions of all of our podcasts. Thank you to Jackson and Corey and go Cavs. I agree. Go Cavs. <laughs>